As you see on the screen, the Bible, uh, the scripture and the, the title, a prayer of letting go and letting God. And it's one of the most, of all of the passages on prayer that we've covered the last several weeks, this is one of the most powerful. The key verse is, matter of fact, uh, uh, it was real popular last week was our kickoff to the, we have two different bulletins. We have our regular bulletin, and then we have uh, a bulletin for the kids that are in here. It's an engaging bulletin uh, with find a word, even though I heard some adults were kicking in on the find a word. On the find a word, it's patterned after uh, Luke 22, and our key verse is verse 42, and the verse is really around it. And so, in that, uh, and so I, I'm so glad that the parents that have kids that do use the uh, interactive kids bulletin, it's interactive because of they're supposed to listen for the words that I say, who's speaking, what am I speaking about. And so I pray, matter of fact, I pray that all sermons that I preach would be interactive, that you're, that you're keeping up in your Bible, marking your Bible, make your Bible your own, and that uh, you... Uh, follow along and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? In verse 42, which is really the key, I just want to start there, and then we will gather some of the other scriptures. This is Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane in verse 42, and uh, skipping on down to that one, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. Let's pray. Father, that is our prayer for this morning. Your will to be done above our own will. In Jesus' name, amen. And <clears throat> I'm going to have to go ahead and apologize uh, because I, I am struggling with a, a head cold this morning, and, and so we will uh, just do the best. And I Hear some of y'all with a cough. It's okay. We've, we've got that. Matter of fact, uh, Deacon was down here this morning, and uh, he was helping me out with the illustration. And I noticed he coughed, and he did this. The, it wasn't around whenever I was a kid. We just coughed, you know. And we just coughed in your face, you know. No, I'm just kidding. We, we, we covered our mouth with our hand, but now they tried to get away from that. Now they use their elbow or their arm trying to keep it away from their hand. And that's really more hygienic and, uh, and what have you. I'm going to need some water. I'm glad it's uh, hanging on. I told Rob to take his time with the baptisms because I was really trying to hustle down and uh, get back in the choir. I really wanted to. This is a powerful song. I appreciate the choir singing that. I did get to enjoy it. I just wasn't fast enough. And Ty was on backwards, upside down, and everything else. And, and so, but couldn't quite get it all together in time to jump back in the choir. But that's a great reason to miss the choir, to have all those baptisms. And so that, that's what I'm talking about. And so in looking at this, matter of fact, I saw so many things in our text. And just letting this passage and this text really speak to you and your heart this morning is my prayer. And, and so we're just going to take off and... With this, and we're, we, matter of fact, tonight we begin something that um, uh, is kind of a, a, a jump back in time, but just giving it a, and that's home prayer groups, and I've got our list down here, and, and we're going to go over those, and if you're a host, be sure and stay for just a couple of minutes, meet me down front, and uh, grab a spot on the pew, I'll hand you your list. Uh, they're still open. There's a few people. Can't, well, I didn't get back there to sign up. There's still several open spots. Just come on down and just uh, the, all the hosts will be down here, down front. And there's still those open spots. And so we can get you in to a home prayer group. And to, so tonight we will begin those and dividing up into small groups. They're anywhere from a half a dozen to uh, two dozen or whatever, and they go and they have prayer time together, sharing prayer burdens. And so Jesus had his home prayer group. He did. Many times he would call just a select few of the disciples apart for times of prayer. 
And here he does the same thing. And he, matter of fact, let's just take off with it in 39 through 42, but I'm just going to read a couple of verses. The Bible says in Luke 22, 39, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. Notice it says, as he was accustomed on your screen, it says as he want, or it means as he was accustomed. And his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed. So he had done this before. He had, and many times he would have private prayer times. And as I put, this was a, a, a place and a time for prayer. It's intentional. And there's times that we do that in our worship service. We have intentional prayer. We'll call on somebody. Usually, if you want, if uh, you want to get called on by the pastor, you, you, usually we see taller people. Taller people, aisle people get picked out a lot of times. If you make eye contact with the pastor, we're going to call on you to pray. Okay. <laughs> And so while we're about to call on somebody to pray, and if you don't want to pray, you just look down. Don't make eye contact. But sometimes when I see people do that, I intentionally call on them to pray. And uh, when I see their head go down, and so I wasn't ready. Or I'll get them whenever they just got a big old mouthful of gummy bears or some other kid's snack, and I'll call on them to pray. And, uh, or if they're talking to their wife, I'll call on them to pray. And, uh, but... Is so many times we do have intentional prayer in church. And then, like I'm trying to lead the church to do, can we have intentional prayer with small groups? Yes, you can. And matter of fact, it needs to be intentional. There's times when you say, Brother Michael, I don't feel, people have said this a gazillion times to me, I don't feel like praying. I don't feel, and many times, that is the time when we need to pray the most, amen? When we don't feel like praying. And and I'm sure now this is the middle of the night. This is after the Lord's Supper has been instituted. They've already done all that. Judas has gone out. He's been gone for a while. He's rounding up his henchmen. We find out later it's the hour and the power of darkness, as he calls it here, Jesus does. And so it's intentional, and just like I mentioned also, you have your personal time, which is the Jesus called the prayer closet, and then even sometimes you have intentional prayer at an altar call. We call the last part of our service the invitation, and all it is, it's not meant to be a time of hyper-emotionalism, it's not meant to be a time of pressure, but it is an open time for you to respond to ever how the Holy Spirit is bothering you, okay? And then it goes on to say, so he went to that place, and he had this prayer request. Uh, And I, I put in your bulletin an intentional prayer request. Even Jesus made intentional prayer requests. He said, guys, I need y'all to, and many times he would do this, he told Peter, Uh, Whenever he said, Satan has a desire to sift you as wheat, he said, Peter, I'm praying for you. Uh, He said that. Jesus said, I'm praying for you that, uh, and when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. In other words, when you're fully given over. (coughs) Pardon me. And uh, so this is a temptation. Hey, we need to pray. I'm praying for you, and you pray for me. But his prayer request was that you may not enter into temptation Guess what that is? And and again, I put that this, folks, temptation is coming for all of us. Temptation to follow Jesus or to fight Jesus. I am going to put that in this sermon many times. Many times I'm going to talk about the word this morning, intentional. And several times this morning I'm going to say this, and folks, these were saved people, all of them were saved except for the crowd that came to arrest him in Judas. Okay, we find out that he was the son of perdition. He had a choice, but God knew he would reject Jesus. God knew he would betray Jesus, and he was, he was chosen. And folks, the Bible, unless you believe the Bible's a lie, Jesus Christ loved him anyway. Aren't you glad that Jesus loves us anyway? He loves us anyway. When we, when we mess up, he loves us anyway. Whenever we don't do what we should, we, uh, he loves us anyway. 
And so in this text, we see, I'm going to repeat this, you're going to either follow Jesus or you're going to fight Jesus. Over and over in this text, you're either following Jesus or you're fighting Jesus. And many people have done that in their life, in my life, following Jesus or fighting Jesus. He goes on in verse 41 to what I call a stone's throw. Um, The Matthew's account says he went a little farther. I'm glad Jesus goes a little further for us. I'm glad that he goes the extra mile for us. Matter of fact, this stone's throw was a very common distance that he went away from the disciples. And and that stone's throw was, I call it the distance of death because it was a reference to Jewish stoning, okay, in which people, they knew exactly what a stone's throw was. And looking at this, Jesus, even though he was not stoned to death, he died a Roman death on the cross, basically to fulfill the promise that he would be a curse for us. The Bible says in the Old Testament, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. He took your curse and my curse, the curse of sin. And that's what we see in this verse 41. And notice this, even going the distance of death, even though he knew what lay before him, he knelt down and prayed. And then we come to the prayer that needs to be our prayer this morning. Of any verse, let verse 42 speak to you this morning. Of any verse, let this verse sink down in your ears. What does it say? Father, if it's your will, take this cup from me. Remove this cup. Take it away. But he ends up, Lord, not my will be done but your will be done. Sometimes God is asking you to do something that you may be uncomfortable with, having a tough conversation and talking to somebody, taking a step of faith, doing something you've never done before. All those things can be scary. Most of the time, the scariest things in life are the unknown. That's some of the scariest things that we have in our life. I remember... um, I'm an adrenaline junkie. I love to, to do things that have got me hurt before. And uh, jumping off houses onto trampolines and, the, and uh, stuff like that. I've been in the emergency room several times. My nose ripped off my face, uh, uh, face split open, all of these things, adrenaline. And, of course, those famous words that my wife hates it when I say, hey, kids, watch this. And uh, so my wife hates it whenever I say that. I'm going to do something I shouldn't do. And, uh, of course, she got me for my birthday. She said, um, okay, here's your birthday gift and got that and, and teamed up. I'm going to go with Caleb, my oldest daughter, going to go skydiving. So looking forward to that. All I need to know is make sure that guy is firmly attached to my back. I said, you ready? Because we're going. Okay. Somebody said, well, how can you do that? I remember the first time I bungee jumped. And I was looking down on the hotel, about 300 feet up. He said, all you got to do is lean forward. I said, that's it? I said, lean forward. And, of course, uh, tied off at the feet. But all those things were, they got my blood to pumping and that adrenaline going. And it was fun. It was exciting to me. Uh, Many have told me, you're stupid. Okay. (laughs) I understand that completely. But a lot of times we get nervous and scared about trying to do something that we've never done before. Share Jesus with somebody. And, or just simply, and people said, well, I don't really feel led to invite people to church. If, if, if you don't feel led to invite people to church, there's something not clicking right. You're not in the midst of revival. You need to be in the midst of revival. You, like I was uh, helping at Branch and Deacon were helping me out, we should want to tell people about Jesus. Amen. We should want to use any means necessary to get our voice to tell others. And like I told my Sunday school class, there's a difference between being shy and being ashamed. Because some of you say, well, I'm, I'm shy. But you're, folks, you're not ashamed because if somebody asks you, you should be willing to answer. Amen? If somebody asks you about Jesus, would you be willing to tell them? Now, sometimes you're shy, and all that means is is you might not go up to people like I would or Brother Rob would 
You might not be like that. But you know what? There's a difference, again, between being shy and being ashamed. Our prayer should be this, one of letting go and saying, God, it's all yours. Moving on, the pressure cooker. So that's Jesus and his prayer group. Verse 43, God knows when you need a boost is what I call this. Then an angel, I believe this is the only uh, Gethsemane account I think Luke says it tells us about this angel appearing to him from heaven, strengthening him. I'm so glad that sometimes in life, have y'all ever had just, you know, said, why did that person call? All of a sudden in your day, you're, you may be struggling with something, and all of a sudden you get a, a text on your phone. You know, one time we were talking about this Wednesday, and uh, matter of fact, we've got a slide that comes up on our slide and it says uh, on our announcements up here and it says, please silence your cell phone. And uh, I was preaching along. Somebody else is telling the same story. I've had it happen to me. Matter of fact, numerous times since cell phones came out, well, it really became popular in the 90s. But I'll be preaching one time. This lady was sitting out there. She not only answered her cell phone, her cell phone rang. She answered it and had a conversation the whole time I'm preaching. It is, and it's, I think it was Grant was telling me about a, a similar story. I said, that has happened to me. I've heard the same thing. But, you know, most of the time when the phone rings during the middle of church, it's not the Lord, okay? <laughs> it's not the Lord calling. But sometimes he has used you to encourage somebody else, amen? amen. Or maybe he used somebody else to encourage you. And I, and I hope and pray that he did and he does do that to you. And I, I pray that you would let God do that. Sometimes you need a boost. Looking on uh, quickly, verse 44. So this prayer is going on. We find out if we harmonize all the Gospels that three times he went and prayed and he would go back and check on the disciples and they were going to sleep on him. The Bible says in verse 44, and be in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And then, again, something that's found only in Dr. Luke. Luke was a physician, and it says his sweat, in verse 44, became as great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And there is a, a, a medical term for that, sweat, blood, or sweat, or blood coming out your pores, and, and different things like that. The... Uh, and looking at this, this pressure that he was under, matter of fact, I put literally out of the Greek lexicon the an, a meaning of that word in your bulletin where it says, what did this agony mean? It meant intense sorrow, great mental, emotional grief and anxiety. Folks, Jesus was under so much pressure here, you say, he didn't have anxiety. Yeah, he did. He had stress. He had anxiety, yet without sinning. He did it to the point to where he was saying this stress, this anxiety, this, this suffering that he was experiencing, he finally said, God, I give it to you. I can't do this anymore. I know there's no way to let this cup pass from me. I will bear it. Now, what cup was he talking about? The cup of every single cotton-picking mistake you've ever made in your life. And every person that's ever breathed. Matter of fact, even the unborn. Folks, Jesus died for everybody. Jesus died for all. And my Bible says he's not willing that any should perish, but wants all men to be saved. God knows what you're facing. He knows every stress and anxiety. Jesus craved these prayers. He got up from that prayer in verse 45, and he went back to his disciples. He found them sleeping from sorrow. And then he said, why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation, folks. This, this. So Jesus was craving th their prayers. Jesus was craving to be an example to them. Many times he was. He, he would take a few of the disciples. He said, this is how we do it. This is how we have a home prayer group. This is how we have our prayer time. You have our group time. You have our prayer closet time. But you do it so that we could be ready for the job. And so you've come here this morning. Folks, coming to church, you have worshiped. 
Coming to church, you are listening. Coming to church, you're saying, God, what do you want me to know from your word this morning? But folks, serving him is done when you strap on an apron. Serving him is when you get up and say, I'm going to put my work britches on. I'm going to work around the church house. I'm going to work around uh, the community. I'm going to tell others, folks, our service is outside of these four walls. Yes, you can serve God inside of these four walls, but the majority of our service is outside of these four walls. Moving on quickly, doing, doing okay. The last section that I want to tackle is a tough one, but I'm going to let the text speak for itself this morning. And I call it when you give in to the power of darkness, because, folks, there was no greater, darker time in Jesus' life than this section right here. While he is still speaking, I'm in verse 47. Again, what is the title of this? What, what did I call 47 and 48? When we fight Jesus or follow Jesus. While he's still speaking, a multitude, a band of men, as he was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them, drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? You say, well, that seems strange here in Arkansas. We don't Men don't greet each other with a kiss, thank the Lord. <laughs> okay, I, I like a good old handshake or fist bump, okay? And uh, we got this uh, bug, whatever, head cold, flu going around, fist bump. Get the hand sanitizer, fist bump, hand sanitizer. But I remember being in Eastern Europe one time and being at a church. Matter of fact, the name of the town I was in, get this, and I'm a, I'm a big a sci-fi guy too, well, the name of the town I was in in Romania was called Vulcan. Yeah, Vulcan. You know, I was in that town, and, and uh, this little old bitty church just had about 28 people in it. The men also, they, I was getting translated. They did not speak English. Also glad to see the Americans. They come from America. And he grabbed me, and he went, mwah, mwah. I was going. <laughs> Is that normal? I said, nah. Yeah, that's they were, and, and then they would say pacha, which in Romanian is peace. It's a Christian greeting. Our Romanian team is aware of that word, pacha. And they were so excited. But here Judas used their common greeting as a way to betray. Basically, it would be the same way. I'm going to walk up in the crowd, and whoever's hand I shake, that's the fellow you need to arrest. That's basically what Judas did. Who, I'm going to walk up in this group, and the first person that I shake their hand, that's him. That's who I want you to grab. And so he's asking him, and so many times, like Judas, and you think about all what he faced, or focused on, on money more than the master. We're facing Jesus, and we're going to say, so many times we can, people can walk up to Jesus, kiss him on the face, and spit in the gospel. Because so many times we say we love Jesus with our mouth, but... As soon as we have a chance to tear a hole in somebody, to be able to rip somebody's life apart with gossip, words of slander, ridicule, criti criticism, we will, it doesn't matter what's going on, it doesn't matter what God's doing. People were being saved, healed, right and left. And like the last point in the bulletin so many times, all this can be happening. The gospel is being preached. Souls are being saved. People are being baptized. We're following Jesus. Lives are being changed. People are bringing others to Christ, and we completely miss it. Folks, this band of soldiers, I wonder, we find out his name in another gospel, Malchus, who the, the, uh, Peter whipped out the sword, was going for his head, missed his head, chopped his ear off. Jesus grabbed the ear, put it back on him, and he healed him. I wonder if that fellow got saved. The Bible doesn't tell us what Malchus did. I wonder about him, though. That ear, he said, I, I need to pay attention to this guy. This morning, don't miss Jesus. Amen? Amen? Don't miss Jesus. You can get so caught up, and I'm going to look 
for everything that I don't like. I'm going to look for everything that, that, that I can pick out that is wrong according to my opinion. I'm going to look for all the negative. I'm going to look for the bottle being half empty. To me, it's three-quarter full. Okay, three-quarters full. Get my mouth out right. And so look in how you look at something, and so many times people, and they did, and they said, I would rather die in my sin than change. Because when Jesus, remember this, he's coming along, and so many times I've seen people, and I mentioned this in Sunday school too, I've seen people be critical of the younger crowd. Jesus was a 30-year-old whippersnapper who was out to change tradition. Amen. He was. Every time you pray, you're praying to a young adult. Jesus was 30. And when he died, he was 33 years old. They didn't like him very much. They said, man, I've got socks older than you. Okay, they didn't wear socks. Sandals then. Okay, sandals. I've got sandals older than you. And they said, you know, this, this coming in here in the temple and how dare you heal somebody on the Sabbath? How dare you do that? How dare you make the lame to walk? How dare you make the deaf to, sp and the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak? And they, when they were doing that, what were they doing? They didn't like change. They didn't like somebody doing something different. But the whole point is they missed Jesus. They just missed him. And, that, and a lot of times we miss Jesus. Because of whatever. There's a gazillion reasons why we could miss Jesus. Back in our text, of course, he, in verse 50, he, he uh, the fellow gets his ear chopped off. Verse 51, he touched the ear and healed him. Verse 52, notice the end of verse 52. And that's, that's where I'm going to finish up. One more swig of water. I don't. I don't want the invitation to begin yet. I've got a few more, a couple more minutes of preaching. Okay, if y'all just hang with me and look at these last couple of verses, and then we'll have an invitation, a time for you to respond to ever how the Lord's dealing with you. Folks, this is your hour. Okay, this thing started at 1030. It's 1135 AT&T time right now. Okay, this is your hour. But notice this. He says, um, verse, in middle of verse 52, Jesus says, have you come out against, as against a robber with swords and clubs? Verse, the first part of 53 when I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me. The whole time I was doing good, and you missed that too. You didn't click, it didn't, you didn't understand, and now you're out here to arrest me. But look at that end of verse 53. But this is your hour. And notice the end of it. And the power of of darkness. Folks, this morning, you're either fighting Jesus or following Jesus. And this is your hour. You will choose this morning what to do with Jesus. If you're saved, you can still fight him. And you can still backslide and still rebel and say, I don't want revival. I want God on my own terms. And I want Jesus in the prescription that I like, prescribed in just the right doses. This flu and all this stuff going around in the United States, just in the United States, since September, 6,000 people have died from the flu. You can Google it. It's not near as bad as the 1718 season, just in the U.S. People get a flu shot. And you know what a flu shot is? A flu shot is them giving just a, a bit of that virus, ever, you know, a dead virus or a small amount of virus, and they're, 
and they inject it in you. I got to not talk about that too much. I'll pass out. But they inject that virus in you. Try not to think about it. And it, your body starts creating antibodies to fight against that strain. And sometimes people come to church and they say, Preacher, can you just give me a little bit of Jesus so that I could be able to resist him the rest of the week and that I'll have a defense? I'll feel better about myself when we get inoculated to Jesus. We just get a little dose on Sunday morning. And that's all right, I can resist him now because I've done my part. What about you? This is your hour. Let it be the power, instead of the hour of darkness, the hour of light, an hour of change, in a time of revival, in a time where I'll say, yes, and not my will be done, but what? Your will be done. Let's pray. Father.